Revelation chapter number 6. Revelation chapter number 6. We are now well into the beginnings of the tribulation period. Uh, boy, for a foot of time, they banned. Uh, we, we opened that first seal. I uh, wait everybody gets these out here. Uh, the seal of Antichrist. We were talking the other night with another pastor and myself about that seven seal book. And he said, what does it represent? I said, it represents the seven seals of the judgment that God had started in the tribulation period. And that's what he came and took it. And now the God that Christ is beginning to open up uh, these seals for us. In chapter 6, verse number 1, we found the introduction of the great pretender. He pretends to be a man of the people. I'm going to be your leader for all people. Oh, so I'll tell you what, they give him a crown, they set him up. Uh, we found uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, he made a statement in chapter number 11, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Look what he said, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Today, people do not recognize who Satan is. He's transformed himself into an angel of light. Now, what was he? He was the light bearer in heaven. He was the most glorious of the cherubims. Cherubims were defenders of the holiness of God. That was why his breach was as great as it was. Well, you find the cherubim, you find them in the tabernacle and the temple, and they overshadow the mercy seat. You find them in the veil. You find them in front of the veil where the golden altar of incense is. One of them with a wing touching one of the uh, walls of the, the tabernacle and the temple. The other one touching another one stretching all the way across. They were defenders of the holiness of God. He's a pretender. He is a devil. They call him the, that great <coughs> dragon. So we find that he is introduced. But he said, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, what do they do? They pretend that they're ministers of righteousness, when actually they're ministers of wickedness. We have a lot of that in our uh, day. You get into a lot of these televangelists. Uh, they've been exposed time and time over the years, yet they, their following just continues on. Uh, you know, the people, they, they evidently like what they hear. They evidently like what they see. We, boy, I've, I've seen those exposures, and at the same time, we find that the people accept them. The pretender's great acceptance. I believe that man's delusion from God. Someone asked me one time, what was the strong delusion that God will send them in second? Thessalonians. I believe it's Antichrist. I believe he's going to have all the answers. I believe when he comes, they're deluded. Hey, these people today are deluded. Across our nation today, they're, they're deluded. I mean, these people, you can openly see what people are in politics, and yet they say that's not what they are, and people think that they are what they say they are without looking at what they are. You know, uh, some, sometimes uh, your life exposes a whole lot more than the words that you say. So we find the great acceptance, Antichrist, the God of this world. So we find that delusion taking place in America. What is it? Socialism is the answer to all your problems. I've got news for you. Socialism has never worked, and socialism will never work. It is a failed economic policy that I call Robin Hood economics. Robin Hood always robbed the rich and gave to the poor, but the poor always remained poor. And, and that's what socialism is. And then we found the what he's revealed in Second uh, uh, Thessalonians will be some great uh, delusion. Now the second, third, and fourth seal. I'm just running over these because we open it up. God's opening. This is what God is giving to man. You see it opening up. I've often said God will always give you what you want. It will always cost you what you've got. So God is giving the people what the people are actually wanting. So we got to the second, third, and fourth seals, the rise and the effects of socialism, a one-world government at the end time. It will be both a dictatorship and a socialistic society. 
the effects of socialism, totalitarianism. Amen. I get tongue tied sometimes. Amen. That just means it's all for the total state. Everything's for the state. Amen. You, that's all right. You laugh at me now. You get this old one of these days yourself. But anyway, we find that with all power manifested in Antichrist of his starvation of masses and the suppression of the opposition. Now, what I want to get to tonight is I want to get into what's called the fifth seal. If you look down in verse number nine, and when he had opened the fifth seal, something has happened in these seals. But if you look in verse number eight, he said, Behold, a pale force, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and the beast of the earth. Now, you have a lot of people that talk about the first part of the uh, tribulation period being light tribulation. If you took the fourth part of the earth today, you're talking about two billion people. The death of two billion people, more than had been killed in every war since the beginning of history, killed in just a short time. So we find him setting up a massive kingdom. But he said in verse number nine, uh, nine, he said, And I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So I, I want to look at this fifth, fifth seal tonight. What is it? It's the martyrs for Christ. These are people that are dying for the cause of Christ. Now, I want to deal with them in two ways tonight. And reach me, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, not long ago, they put out what's called the Left Behind series. Y'all remember that several years back? Well, that's, that's a teaching of Peter S. Ruckman at the same time. Peter S. Ruckman... Uh, was heretical in a lot of his teachings, and we'll deal with that in just for a moment. But what they said was, if you miss the rapture, that you get a second chance during the tribulation period. I think Second Thessalonians uh, takes that down. Look back up again under A, but Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. He said, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, we find people here that had the truth of God given to them, but they rejected the truth of the word of God that saves. This is a willful thing with them. But he ended up in verse 11 and said, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So we find that they are sent a lie. They receive that lie. If you look down at the bottom of the page, the martyrs for Christ. I want to clarify who they're not. They're not people that have heard the gospel and rejected before the rapture and chose to be saved under the persecution of Antichrist. There's several things we're going to look at but many years ago. I remember a, a, a man was passing out. He came by our church and he was passing out booklets that taught this same false doctrine about the God of second chance. They, the name of the book was called What to Do in Case You Miss the Rapture. Now, I know, don't know if anybody's familiar with that book. That's a booklet by Peter S. Ruckman. Peter S. Ruckman came out of Pensacola, Florida. He's a graduate of Bob Jones University. Uh, him and by the way, him and Dr. Custer were in the same class together at Bob Jones University. They were two extreme opposite ends of the pole. Mm -hmm. But Peter S. Ruckman wrote this, and the booklet was full of doctrinal error. And I, I think 
this needs to be dealt with and dispelled in our day because people still have this thinking, hey, if I don't get saved now, I can live the way I want. I've got plenty of time to get saved later. I believe scripturally that that is a false premise. Here's what was in this. These are just the major points in that booklet. One, these are his words, don't get excited. Now, friend, if you miss a rapture of the church, you better get excited about something. All right? Now, they're going to receive us. I don't know what uh, they're going to be talking about us that are missing. I don't believe there's going to be as many missing as people think. Why you got Christendom, we put that umbrella of everybody that professes anything about Jesus Christ, any church, any denomination, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter how you come, it makes no difference. Everybody just, we're one big happy family. Friend, we are not one big happy family. Our Lord said, and few there be that find it. I believe salvation is something that has to be sought for in a particular manner. That's what he's talking about. Don't get excited teaching second chance. The second thing, these are Peter S. Ruckman's words, start working your way to heaven. What he was teaching was that salvation after the rapture is a mixture of works and faith. He also taught that as before the coming of Christ in the Old Testament economy that man was saved by both his faith and his works and a mixture of them. You go to Acts chapter number 15, they dispelled that completely. Don't want to get into that tonight, but I want to say that no man, woman has ever been able to merit their salvation with God. Not one of us tonight is good enough to go to heaven. Salvation has to be by grace. It has to be through faith and faith alone. Mixture of faith and works. The third thing he said, don't take any mark or any number. They will take a mark or a number. Now, I'm talking about ones that have heard <coughs> the gospel on this side. Because we're going to deal with some people that don't. They're the ones that are going to die in the tribulation period. But don't take any mark or any number. I loved point number four. He said, get fanatical. They're not fanatical today. What, what would make you think that they're going to get fanatical over on the other side? It doesn't cost you anything to get saved today. I'm going to deal with that under point three. But then it says support the Jewish people. Now, those that have heard the gospel, if they'll not come to Christ before the rapture of the church, they will receive Antichrist that they all, according to 2 Thessalonians. Look in verse number 12. I'm not going to read all this. The 2 Thessalonians verses, uh, 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 chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Verse 12 said that they all, A-L-L. -L. Now, what does all mean in the Greek? Anybody know what all means in the Greek? All. all means all, and that's all all means. Now, when the Bible says all, that's an all inclusive word. So all of these that love not the truth, they receive not the truth of God, they have no love for the truth, they'll be sent strong delusion that they all might be damned according to the word of God, who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we find this crowd that has heard the gospel. I'm talking about a clear presentation of the gospel of Christ. There's people all around this earth today that have not heard a clear presentation of Christ. Mm. I had rather live in the darkest of Africa on the loneliest island in the world than to die and go to hell off of a church pew in the Bible Belt. Mm. I'm talking about these people, they have rejected the truth of the Word of God. What is the problem? We'll get to that in a few moments. But I want you to look in Luke 23. I, I'm going to pull this out of context. I'm not going to break, make a, a pretext. But when Christ was going to the cross, he was carrying that, that cross beam of that cross, and he fell under the load of that thing, and they chose a man to pick up part of that cross and carry part of that cross with him. And he began to speak to the women who were there weeping beside of the way. It's called Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross. As he was going through the streets of Jerusalem, they were lining those streets. They were following after him, and the women began to weep. Now, Luke chapter 23, this is what Christ said to them. 
Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. Now, we're going to deal with that under the sixth seal. But I want you to notice the last part that he said. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Now, let me give you an explanation of what he said. What was a green tree? That green tree is when there's life. Mm -hmm. They had Jesus Christ on this earth. They heard him expound the word of God. He was the word of God. They watched him as he healed the lame, healed the lepers, put eyes in the blind, hey, raised the dead, walked on water, stilled storms, fed milk, heaven tears. They followed this man for three and a half years just to find some fault with him. And Pilate said, I find in him no fault at all. Right. So the green tree is they've got Jesus Christ right here on the earth with them, and they crucified him. Right. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So what happened in that green tree was they didn't want him. Do you remember the rich man who died and went to hell in Luke chapter number 16? He said, Father Abraham, he said, send Moses. Go, go tell, go send somebody to my five brothers. Tell them not to come to this terrible place. And what Abraham said was, he said, they'll not believe. They wouldn't believe no one rose from the dead. So we live right now in what's called a green tree. What does it cost you to get saved? What do you get when you get saved? Yeah. Folks, does it get any better than that? Let me ask you a question. Does it get any easier than that? That you can just come to Christ? Oh, they may oh, they may laugh at you at work and call you goody to you, or they may call you deacon, or they may call you preacher, or they may make fun of you every now and then. But listen, folks, it costs us nothing. It costs the world. I understand that. But at the same time, in a green tree, man, they could have believed on Christ. They followed him. Multitudes, he fed them. But there was a division among them for the words mm -hmm. that he spake and then for the testimony of the life that he lived in front of them. There's two things they couldn't handle. Because he rebuked them. You go to the Sermon on the Mount. I, I was dealing with that the other night. But boy, he said, it hath been said of old. He was talking about the Old Testament. Thou shalt not commit adultery. He was talking about the physical act of adultery. He said, hey, you're not to do that. And the law and the prophets said that you weren't to do that. But then he said, but I say unto you that if a man looks upon a woman to lust, he's committed adultery already inside, in that heart of that individual. See, what Christ did in the green tree was he took it from the outward law that they could see and put it to the inward man where the, the accountability is really at. Where are we accountable? We're accountable to God for who we are. So he said, if these things, if I'm going to be crucified in a green tree, now, look at the last part of that. What shall be done in the dry? What's the dry? The dry is the winter that comes after the fall. The summer takes the sap out of the trees. Boy, they get into a drabness toward the end of summer. I, I call it the dog days of summer where that heat has beat down on these trees. You ever notice in, in the springtime how vibrantly green they are, but how dark and drab they get just before they begin to fall off of that. He said, if they're not going to do this when the sap's up, what are they going to do when the sap's down? In the winter of this year. What's he talking about? He's talking about tribulation period. Now, I want to make a spiritual application. When he said that, he was talking about the days would come when it would be dry. I want you to drop down to number five. If they would crucify the Son of God who walked among them and graciously spoke his word to them, would they accept him when he was gone and great tribulation prevailed? This crowd that didn't want him when it was easy, are they going to give up their life now? 
for coming to Christ? The answer is absolutely not. If they won't get saved now, folks, they won't get saved later. So we're talking about who they're not. Now, I want to look at the fifth seal real quick under E. Who are they? These are tribulation saints. Every believer has been raptured in chapter 4. Every rejecter has received strong delusions, believes the lion is down. There are two things that a person needs to be saved, both now and in the tribulation period. These two things are why these are crucified. Okay, this they've got to have both things. One under A, you've got the essential word of God. What is what? is so valuable about this. We have the very word of God. But in this, in this book you hold in your hand is life. This is a giver of life. When you come to Christ, that's why when they talk about inspiration, I talk about expiration. When Christ or Jehovah God gave the word of God, he spoke out. That's called expiration. When somebody dies, they expire. They breathe out. But what happens is, when you breathe in, we call that inspiration or infusion. What God did with the Word of God, listen, again, I disagree with Peter S. Ruckman at this point. I do not see where we have double inspiration of the Word of God. I believe that's a false doctrine it's taught. But there's another false doctrine told also that you can have the inspiration of the Word of God in the originals without having the preservation of the Word of God, which is through God. I believe we have the very Word of God in our hand today because it's not my duty to preserve it. It's not your duty to preserve it. It's not man's duty to preserve it. It's God's work that preserves the Word of God. You go to chapter 12 of the book of Psalms, the Bible said that he would take that Word of God and that he would preserve that Word of God from this generation, which is to a people, and forever, which is to a time. So we've got the Word of God. So what is essential? The Word of God. Look at Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? Now, if you don't have the Word of God, hearing it's not going to help you. It's either the Word of God or it's not. I'm not arguing with anybody. I don't argue with anybody. I am a biblicist. I don't believe what my college professor said unless it agrees with the Word of God. I don't agree with what my pastor said unless it agrees with the Word of God. I am a literalist. I believe that God's Word says what it means. It means what it says. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that every word of God is pure. Amen. So if you've got the Word of God, you've got the Word of God. When you go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16, all Scripture is, not was. Did you hear that? Present tense. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. If we don't have the Word of God itself, it can't be profitable to us. We've got to have the Word of God. That's what Timothy had. That's all he was dealing with over in Timothy. Now, I'm just saying that to say this. The essentiality of having the Word of God. Why the attack on the Word of God for the last 150 years? Folks, sir, it's been attacked longer than us. The first thing that Satan ever said through the serpent was, yea, hath God said. Mm -hmm. So it's essential that we have the Word of God. That tells me these tribulation saints have the Word of God. So their faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So the Word of God is essential. The second thing that's essential is the Spirit of God. John chapter 6, verse 44 makes a statement, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Over in John chapter number 3, I, I thank God Dr. John Waters had heard us memorize a lot of scripture. One was John chapter number 3 on the new birth. But Jesus dealing with Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him at night. He knew there was something about this man that only God could do. All right, He said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered immediately. Look what he said. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's not baptism. You go to Ephesians, 
The Bible said they were cleansed by the washing of the water of the word of God. This baptistry up here will wash no sins away. I'm not demeaning that. That is, that is a public confession of faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the badge of the Christian. That is a distinguishing mark for a child of God who comes forth to confess Christ. So when he's talking about that, some say it has to do with a physical birth. Well, that goes without saying. You can't get born again if you didn't get born the first time. So that would be for Caesar's. I believe he is talking about something different. He's talking about the Word of God. You see, Nicodemus came to the Word of God. And now the Word of God is explaining to him how to be saved. So the essentialness of the Spirit of God. He said, except we're born of the water, the Word, and the Spirit of God, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born is spirit. Now, I don't have any problem with that interpretation if they want to go that way. But I think he's talking about something more than being born in the flesh. Because being born in the flesh is an automatic essential. Everybody here has been born, right? right. If you hadn't been born, now let me, let me find out where they cloned you or where you came from. Everybody, everybody hey, woman came out of man and every other man came out of woman. That's just the way this thing works, including the Christ. But the methodology is a little bit different. Now, as we get into the uh, tribulation period of time, remember, every saint is gone. Is that not right? Not leaving anybody. We're not, we don't have any mid-tribulation or, or uh, in that crowd in here, do we? Huh? We're all going out. Listen, when the Lord himself was, shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and trumpet of God, friend, dead in Christ will rise, then we which are alive... That means saved and remain. That means you're not dead yet. You're still walking this earth in a saved condition. We're going to be caught up together. We're all going home. Now, the reason I say that, we go to Romans chapter 10. Now, he's talking to the Jew. He talks about how blessed are the feet of those that preach the gospel. Now, there's going to be preaching in the tribulation. We're going to deal with that. One, you're going to have the 144,000 that are sealed. Two, you're going to have angels that will fly through the air preaching the everlasting gospel during that time. So we find the methodology will change just a little bit, but still people can hear without accepting. Why? It will cost them their life. You confess Christ, you're gone. That was one of the dangers every time the apostle Paul went before uh, Caesar. It was a death sentence to worship any other god than Caesar. That was a law that went across the land. Now, they would allow you to worship another god as long as one day a year that you came and you knelt down and you worshiped Caesar as God. Once you did that, it destroyed your testimony for Christ. So at that point, they said you can do whatever you want. They gave them a paper. I was talking about Mexico this morning. When I was in Mexico, I carried my papers with me because they're subject to stop and frisk on the street. I mean, they say in North America, walking along around all the time saying, I'll blind you glass, I'll blind you glass, trying to find somebody that knows one word of English down there. Hey, we're kind of easy to spot. We told Stephen Kirkendall when he went down there, you know, he, a white guy this tall and about that wide going down there, you are going to be very visible when you walk down the streets down there. So they gave them a paper called a libelous. That paper said that they had bowed their knee to the emperor of Rome and worshipped him as God. From that point on, for that whole year, they could worship anybody they wanted to because if you'll worship the devil, friend, your confession of faith is no good to this world. So the methodology is a little bit different. Now, I want to deal with these martyred saints for a minute. They're sacrificed. The souls are now under the heaven. They are part of the two billion people. Two billion, a fourth of this earth. If I'm not mistaken, right now, the population of the earth is probably a little bit over nine billion. So you're talking about two and a quarter billion people will die 
And that's at the introduction of this socialistic. Once they get the power to reign, they will silence. You think Antifa is bad. You think all of these uh, 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 anarchist outfits that they've got out here are bad. They try to shut down anybody that talks against the socialist left. They try to quieten them. What are they going to do in the tribulation period? They're going to kill them. They'll put them to death. So they are a part of that. Hey, they, they either opposed or failed to obey Antichrist. Now, I want to look at their service. That's their sacrifice. There's a couple of things they did. In Revelation 6 and 9, the Bible said, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for one, the word of God, and two, for the what? Testimony which they held. So the word of God had effectively worked in their life and brought about a conversion that could be outwardly seen. I understand that salvation's inside. But what's on the inside, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are. A-R-E. That's in the present tense. Are become new. In other words, hey, we are a new creature in Jesus Christ. So we find in Revelation chapter 6 two things. But I want to tie it with Revelation chapter 1. As we introduce the, the uh, Re book of Revelation, in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who is in the isle that is called Patmos, here's what, he, here's what they exiled him for, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Same thing with him that you're going to find there. You see, it's always been the same way. I'm not talking about Christendom again in quotation. When I do this, I'm putting it in quotation marks. I'm being facetious. I'm talking about those who have truly been converted and live for Christ. They have a desire. They've got something in them that is a driving force. I think about a dynamo. When they talk about the dynamite of the word of God, I liken it more to a dynamo. The dynamite blows up. And then the explosion is gone. But a dynamo has the power to continue to drive something. Years ago, Barbara and I, when we were still going together, we went down to Kentucky Lake. Anybody's ever been there, been over the bridge of Kentucky Lake? You go over, they've got these giant turbines down there operated by the water. You've got Kentucky Lake 300 and something feet. Uh, deep up here and down here, and it's huge differential. And that water running through there, it dries these big uh, turbines that produce uh, 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 power for TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. We went down and had a register, and we signed it, Mr. and Mrs. Robert D. Johnston. Now, none of you kids ever did anything like that. We signed it like we were married. I mean, we went down, spent the day just driving around, had a good time. Now they got Lake Barkley. But those things, boy, if you ever heard that high-pitched sound, they let you go right down to where those turbines are turning, that water churning as it's coming out of the bottom of that thing, producing that uh, hydroelectric power that they've got in that area. That's what the Word of God is in a child of God. It's not a dynamite explosion that goes off and is gone. It's a dynamo of power that continues to drive that spiritual engine. That's what he's talking about here. John, he was persecuted exactly, I'm talking about 2,000 years previous, he was exactly the way they were going to be in the tribulation period. One, for the word of God. Their conviction about the Bible. Their love for the word of truth. That's what he talked about in 2 Thessalonians. Because they loved not the truth. They didn't love the word of God. They didn't hold that word of God. I thank God that God's given us a Bible we can hold on to tonight. That's not a bad thing, folks. That is a good thing. I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. This will, hey, this will get you through life. It'll take you to heaven. It'll show you how to walk, how to talk. It'll show you how to live your life. That's what this thing is. For conviction for the Word of God. You compare that with the Antichrist. The second thing was on the next page, their confession. Their conviction of the Word of God, but their confession or their testimony for God. These martyred saints lived 
and confess to others Jesus Christ. Now they have become the preachers of Romans chapter number uh, 13. You know, the Bible said, how shall they uh, believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear except that uh, somebody preach? How shall he preach except to be sent? How beautiful are the feet? Uh, I tell people that these are beautiful feet in the eyes of God. Yours are beautiful feet. Why? We carry the gospel of peace to a world out here. And I don't care how ugly your feet are physically. They're beautiful in the sight of the one that gets saved. I thank God for the man that was instrumental in getting me back in church where I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sammy Davis Jr. Boy, a dear friend. That eventually Sammy got out of church. I hate that so bad. He, he, was a, he was a soul winner. He wore a fish hook on his shirt. I didn't know what. I just thought he liked to fish and maybe he got one hung in his shirt and didn't get it out, just cut the line off it. I didn't know what. Yes, I didn't know anything. I was one of them that not only didn't know much, I didn't suspect a whole lot. But he told me he had gotten saved. Barbara and I used to run around when we were still going together with him and his wife, Lauren, and said, and they'd take us places, do things with us kids. They, they were a real good role model to young people. They, they loved kids and young teenagers, and we'd run around with them. I saw him some years later. I knew he was out of church. Listen, he had a lot going on. Had a son that died. Had a lot, lot went on that... And I understand where he was at. I saw him walking across the parking lot. And friends, I cut, a, I cut a streak over there to him. And I thanked him for being a part of leading me to Christ. And told him I was pastor of the church in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I told him the same thing I told Brother Bob Lamb. I said, that is fruit to your account. So we find not only their conviction of the word of God, but we find also their confession of the Son of God. Their lives were bearing fruit unto salvation. And friend, Antichrist will not take that. So they were martyred. Now, we find that they're resting saints. Look at verse number 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Do you pray that way? I, I, I ask God, why don't you do something? Give us, give us a little help down here. Give us a little nudge down here. Help us, help us out a little bit. That's, that's what they're doing here. How long? We find that out through the, all through the Psalms. O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Look at verse 11. And white robes were given unto them, every one of them, we'll deal with that. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season. Why? Wow. Because there's going to be a lot more of them die before this thing gets settled. Well, people have always died for Christ. They have always died. Abel, the first man who died for the word of God and his testimony for Christ, killed by his own brother. We find their cry of vengeance as they cry out to God from the, under the altar that God would avenge. If you look under B or A there, Romans 12, 19. This is why God is not listening to he's listening, but he's not doing what they say. <clears throat> Dearly beloved, vengeance not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we find their cry, they're ordered to rest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. There reigneth, remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Aren't you glad? Thank God we've got a rest coming. The older I get, and, and I talk to a lot of these older people around here sitting, hey, you just pray for these older people. It doesn't take much for them to get tired. How many of you old people are tired tonight? <laughs> How many of you are retired? Yeah, you were tired yesterday too, so now you're tired, you're tired again. This thing goes with, goes with the property. I'm not near the man I was five years ago. I'm not near the man I was ten years ago. I'm not near the man I was when I was 40, when I was 30. Oh, hey, I'm not near what I was. Listen, we are wearing down, and God just tells them that there's a rest that way. Why? They've done their work. One has planted, another has watered, and God has given the increase of millions of people 
being saved in the tribulation period, but they are dying for their faith. That's why it said that they'll endure to the end. <coughs> they have that testimony. They're ordered to rest and to wait. Then they're clothed in white robes, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne, O Lamb of God, I come. I love that verse scripture. Love it over in Jude, verse number 24. That when he'll present us faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. And then, and then verse 25 says, to the only wise God. Amen. God knows what he's doing. They're clothed in the righteousness of God. We find it then in Revelation 7. We also find it in Revelation 14. But I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he asked who those saints were. He said unto me, These are those which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Salvation has never changed. These tribulation saints are not saved by their works. They made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And then we find their prospect of multitudes coming. In verse number 11, the white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little while until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Brethren, they are going to die for their faith all through the seven years. Now, he's dealing here with Gentiles. What happens in the mid little part, all right? He's going to begin dealing specifically with the Jew himself. But everything's set up for that today. We, I believe we're on the threshold of it. Always have been. I may die of old age. That's all right. I'm good with that too. One of these days I'll close these eyes down here and I'll wake up on the other side and I'll be finally at home and it'll be all right. And if we go in a rapture, that won't be bad either. Somebody said, I'm afraid of heights. You'll be home before you know you're gone. Yeah. You'll be home in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, friend. That quick, one four hundredth of a second. If I got my information right, that's about the length of a twinkling of an eye. One four hundredth of a second. You see it sparkling as well. These are tribulation saints. They're going to die. Listen, if they won't get saved in a green tree, my friend, you don't have to worry about them getting saved when the sap's down. They will die eternally. But these right here will live forever. Amen. All right, we're going to be stand up night have an invitation. The fifth seal. What is it? People are going to die. Friend, they're going to die. 